Now, what I want to do this morning, perhaps you'd like to turn to 2 Timothy 2 and 3, and I'll tell you what I'm hoping we'll do in the time that we've got. I've been, been thinking and mulling on what would be the most profitable use of our time. And I thought I would say, uh, uh, yesterday we did something on sort of analysis, what does the passage say, um, coming up with a, a, a theme sentence, a kind of summary of, of what the passage says, our best shot at that. And I said that this morning we would look at um, response, which is the so what question. Uh, how should we respond to this passage? What impact should it have on us? And also communication. How do you put a sermon together and actually preach it? So I thought we'd, I'd say something about those, but I wanted to try to earth them slightly paradoxically. I want to earth them from the next little passage in 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 9, which I'll read in, in just a minute. And I, I want, as it were, to take you into the kitchen. If you think of a sermon as a meal, I want to sort of take you into the kitchen with me and to, to give you some sort of snapshots of how I would set about preparing a sermon on 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Um, it'll, be, it'll be like time-lapse photography. It'll just be a little, a little bit here and a little bit there rather than the whole thing because of the time that we've got. But I'm hoping that coming into the kitchen might be helpful. And you'll find yourself thinking, um, actually, I wouldn't do it that way. Or you may sometimes think, actually, that might be quite a helpful way to, to, to do it that I could feed into my sermon prep. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about communication as well. Let me say a, a, some general things about response first. And uh, it, it's this, that if, you, if you've got your theme sentence, you're, you've got your, this is my best shot at what the passage says, as best I can get it, the main thing that the passage says. You've then got to ask the question, um, what response does God want us to have to the passage now? For what purpose did God, by his Holy Spirit, cause this passage scripture to be written? Uh, originally, what, what was the purpose? And what is his purpose today for the people to whom we're preaching and for us um, ourselves? Obviously, that's, that question, so what, is really important. I think Alan Chappell says in his book that if you don't get to the so what question, you'll be preaching to, to people who'll be asking themselves, who cares? <laughs> if you don't get to who, so what, then people will be thinking, who, 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 who cares? What's the point of it? It'll just become a, an historical academic lecture uh, about some ancient text. So it's a really, really important question. And I just want to give one or two principles. It was really helpful uh, yesterday evening in Hebrews. And Hebrews perhaps uh, lends itself to this more than some other scriptures. But because the writer expounds something and then says, therefore, you know, this is how we should respond. And we saw that so graphically last night. You've got chapter one and then the first four verses of chapter two, therefore. Um, this is how we should respond. So in a way, the, sometimes the Bible writers will kind of placard their, their response thing and put it there. And the passage we're going to be look at, looking at does do that, I think, quite clearly. There's an imperative, an instruction, or sometimes a prohibition um, that, 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 that does that. But the question is always going to be, um, how should we respond? And the way that I was t t taught and the way that I we did at the Cornhill training course was to say to people, once you've got a theme sentence, come up with some fairly crisp aim statement. And the aim statement is really saying, why do I think God by his spirit caused the passage to be written? For what purpose does God by his spirit achieve through this passage then, but more particularly now, what should be achieved by that? Which is what I'm going to be preaching for and what I'm going to be praying that God, by his spirit, will achieve through the passage. So a, a, a sort of aim or purpose statement. People use different terminology, but, but that, that sense of so what, um, so what for us. It's important to say that the aim statement or purpose statement is going to arise out of the theme sentence. In other words, uh, what the passage says is going to lead into um, how we should respond to the passage. And it's a really useful exercise to come up with a sort of theme sentence 
and, and then an aim statement that, that arises out of that in some um, way. Now, I, I won't say much more about the, the aim um, statement or purpose statement at this stage, except to make the point that you will well know, as, as those who have experience of pastoral work, that in order to get a purpose statement, you, you need to be bridging the passage and what it says in its original context. You know, Dick Lucas's thing of traveling var Corinth, you know, what was the original purpose for the original hearers? Uh, why was it written? For what was the purpose? What was going to be achieved through it? Um, with the people to whom we're preaching, and indeed we ourselves and our own hearts. And therefore, the knowing of people is critical. So all the time that you spend week by week with people, sitting alongside people, listening to people, talking to people, praying with people, all of that feeds into it. And as you're coming up with a, with a sort of purpose statement, and you're thinking, what am I praying will be achieved through this passage? You're, you're thinking of the, the men and women who are on your hearts, people who are on your hearts. And sometimes people deliberately think of an older man or an older woman or a younger man or a younger woman or an unmarried person or a divorced person or a, you know, different people in the church and maybe think, so where should this passage land? What kind of impact should this passage have on him or on her? And that's really important, which is why it's very difficult to preach if we're not engaged in regular pastoral contact with people. Really hard. I remember the, some, the, some of the worst, I mean, I've preached very badly on many occasions, but one of the times that haunts me really is when I'd been doing my formal theological studies in Oxford. And for various reasons, because of having a young family and things, I hadn't been very actively involved in engagement with people for 21 months of fairly intense study. And then I went and preached in a church to which we'd belonged in, in another part of the country. And I preached technically well. You know, I, I could read, it was Colossians, I remember it well, I, and I could read it in Greek and I, I could work out the sentence structures and I read monographs on the Colossian heresy. And I knew a whole bundle of stuff more about Colossians than I'd ever known before. Um, and I preached really badly because it didn't really engage with the people to whom I was preaching. I found it really hard to pray myself into their shoes. And um, I've never forgotten that. So the study of people will, will feed into all that. Let's have a look at, at 2 Timothy 3, uh, 1 to 9. And uh, I'll, I'll try and, as it were, take you into the kitchen and, and we'll think through theme and aim and then think about how we might put a sermon together from this passage. So the context, of course, we're familiar with from yesterday when we looked at the previous passage from verse 14. Uh, and 2 Timothy 2 verse 14 is the point where, where Paul shifts from a personal appeal to Timothy, uh, chapter 1, 1 to 1, 13 is mostly a personal appeal to Timothy to be a faithful pastor. Uh, but from 2, 14, the church in Ephesus begins to come into view. And we begin to pick up these indicators of what's going on in the church in Ephesus and why there's trouble and why it's so important that Paul, uh, that, that Timothy preaches and pastors and leads um, well. And then verse, uh, chapter 2 ends with, from verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, uh, which many of the others were being, but kind to everyone, able to teach that ability to teach not just an intellectual uh, or oratorical ability, but a relational ability, loving the people to whom he's ministering and preaching, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. There's that little hopeful note. And they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So that's where we get to at the end of the previous passage. 3 verse 1, but understand this, uh, and there's a contrast really to the hopeful tone of verses 25 and 26. God may give them repentance, but we need to be realistic, says 
Paul, you need to understand this, that in the last days, and of course as you're preparing, you think to yourself, the last days, I'm going to need to teach people didactically. I'm going to need to teach people that the last days means the entire period from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And I need to do sort of crisply, I need to teach them that so that they know that's what the last days refers um, to. In the last days, there will come times of difficulty, painful times, difficult times. So, so that sets the tone for this passage, times of difficulty. And it's going to become apparent that these times have already begun. So, so they will come. As you preparing, you're anticipating the things where people might misunderstand. And you're thinking, there will come times of difficulty, but actually Paul is speaking about times that have started already, and that will become apparent as we read through. There will come times of difficulty. Four, and so you say to yourself, structurally, here is the reason why there will come times of difficulty. And verses two to five tell us why there will come times of difficulty um, in these last days. For people will be, and then there's a great list, and Obviously, when you're preparing, you need to work through the list you know, with the help of um, commentary or whatever so that you know the meaning of the words. And you read through lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and so on. And you, the danger is you skim those lists, isn't it? You get those lists of vices or virtues in, in Scripture. And the danger is we just think, ah, good stuff or ah, bad stuff. <laughs> um, but we want to work through it carefully. I want to think, is there, is there something that sort of governs and holds together the the list and so you do the work on that and you, you 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 notice that it begins with two references to love lovers of self lovers of money which is pretty much the same thing because I love money because money enables me to do for myself what myself wants to do um, so lovers of money and lovers of self are are very closely related you notice there's a reference to to love at the end of verse 3, not loving good. And then there's another reference at the end of verse 4, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So you do the work on the list, but you say to yourself, if I'm going to teach this list, I'm not. if you're writing a commentary, you go through each of them and you tell us exactly what the words mean and so on. But if you're preaching it, you want people to get some sense of how it all fits together. And those loves at the beginning and the middle and the end help. Uh, this, this, this is something that relates to the human heart and the desires of the human heart. But it's a bad list. It's a really bad list and it's a grim list. And, and you know, by the time you've gone through the arrogance and the abusiveness and the disobedience to parents and the ingratitude and the unappeasable sort of person you can't placate and slanderous and no self-control and brutality um, and treachery and... And, and conceit and so on, you, you, you say to yourself, I need people to feel not just what the word means, words mean, but the, the sense of how awful this is. And then you're working through it, and you come to verse 5, and you get a massive surprise, because you read verses 2, 3, 4, and you think this is a dreadful list of how the world behaves out there. There are all these terrible people. There are bad people out there. And the shock of verse five, and we really want to get hold of the shock as we're, as we're preaching it, is that you, you ask, where do we find these people? And the answer is, we find them in church. That's the shocking thing. You don't have to go into the red light district of Ephesus because they have the appearance of godliness. And so you, Helpful, really, relating to what we looked at yesterday in the previous passage. They've got the appearance of godliness. They are, in our terms, they are Bible people. You know, the false teachers in Ephesus were Bible people. There were a lot of words going on, and the words that were being spoken were related to the Scripture in some way, almost certainly. So they have the appearance of godliness. They are, they're in church. They are Bible people. They look the part. And indeed, a number of them may be in the pulpit. In the context, it becomes clear that these people aren't just sitting there in church. Um, some of them are, are teaching. 
but they deny its power. End of verse 5, avoid such people. So you, you, you make a mental note, avoid such people. That's the first imperative, the first command that's been given in this passage, avoid such people. And if you're looking, you're beginning to think, I'm going to need to come up with an aim or purpose statement, and I come up with a clear imperative, avoid such people. I think to myself, that just might help when it comes to a purpose statement. It may just help. Here is a clear command, avoid such people. So I sort of make a little mental note of that. But then we're working on, so this is like in the kitchen and you're, you're, you're kind of going through collecting your uh, materials together. Verse 6, 4, again there's a, a logical connective word. Here is a, the reason for Timothy to avoid such people. He's not just to avoid them because they're mad, but he's uh, bad, but he's to avoid them um, because of the reason given in verse 6 and 7. So you just make a note that that's the sort of structure of the passage. For among them, uh, the, the, these people who behave like verses 2 to 4, but who have the appearance of godliness, so they're in church, they're church people, Bible people, um, and among them are those who creep into households. And you do the work on that, and I think the NIV says worm their way, which is quite a good translation, really. It's that sense of there's something. They don't go in through the front door openly. They creep in in some way through the back door. They, 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 they sneak in to households. And in these households in Ephesus, they find weak women. At which point, of course, as a preacher, you think, this is really tricky. Because some people are going to say, oh, does the Bible think all women are weak and all men are good and strong? So you just make a little mental note in the margin, as it were, of your, of your notes that you need just to head that one off at some point. Say, so clearly there were weak women in Ephesus then, in the ways that are about to be described. But that doesn't mean that all women are weak. And you might make a mental note that actually the men, it seems to be men who are doing this bad stuff, um, they're pretty bad. So you just make a note, you know, just otherwise there'll be somebody there, uh, you know, a millennial who'll be sitting there and they'll hear capture weak women and they will just switch off from the whole sermon at that point. They won't listen to anything else. This is just bigoted nonsense. How could I listen to this? So you think as a preacher, I need to anticipate that um, and just, just head that off. But anyway, there they are, these weak women. And the description is... It's a sad description. They're burdened with sins. So it is a description, I think, of unconvertedness. They've got this heavy burden of sins on them, and the burden doesn't seem to be lifted. They're led astray by various passions. There may be a hint of sexual misbehavior here. It may be that these men were sort of creeping in, and as many abusers have done in history, and pastors who've abused. They've, they've exploited their power and influence over these women for sexual favors. It's possible. Paul doesn't explicitly say so, but there's something of an atmosphere that certainly might fit with that. But it's a sad picture. They're burdened with sins. They're led astray by various passions, and they're always learning. Isn't that interesting? Do you think, what's going on with these women? They're always learning. And remember, there are lots of words around. There's a great deal of learning, uh, of words around. Paul calls it babbling and empty words and so on. But there's a lot of words around. And presumably these people are speaking words. And these women are always learning. So you, you, at that point you're trying to think, what's going on with these women? You're trying to understand what's going on. They're always learning, but they're never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So you, you grapple with that and you think about it. And you think, what's going on with these women? So they're hearing words, and some of them may be related to Bible or church, churchy words of some sort or another. And they're hearing them, and they're hearing them, and they're hearing them. But somehow they're never freed from the burden of their sins. So there's something about these words that is not gospel. And they're, and they're left there. They're still burdened with their sins. They're still pulled around by their passions. There's no... Uh, sense in which God has given them new birth or they've been saved by the grace of the gospel. They don't arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They're never set free in some way. So you, you clock all that and you think, okay, that's a sad picture, but that's, that's what's happening here. 
And so you're thinking verses 2 to 4 is not just saying there's bad stuff going on. But verse 5, the bad stuff is people who are in church who look the part and they're influencing people in this dreadful way. And so you get that, that sense of what's going on in Ephesus. And then you come to verse 8 and you think, I don't know what to do with verse 8 because Janus and Jambres don't appear in my concordance. You know, you do your word search and you don't find them anywhere. And um, so Paul says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, um, so whoever they were, they opposed Moses. And you then have a little problem. You, we may want to discuss this later, but you get some help from your friends, your live friends or your dead friends, and you discover that in, in Paul's day, um, in the kind of stories that you got in the, in the religious bookshops, as it were, of the day, you know, the kind of sensationalist, stuff that you get in religious bookshops of the day there would be stories in which um, the Old Testament stories would be elaborated you get it in things like the book of Jubilees you know you can get you can get hold of this stuff and you read all this stuff and they'd elaborate all these things and you discover that in the in in Paul's day Janus and Jambres were the names that were given to the, to Pharaoh's magician and so you think I slightly wish I didn't have to find that from outside the Bible, but we might want to discuss that um, later on. Anyway, Paul's, re you know, Timothy would have known that. And uh, in Paul's day, it would seem that people would have known. If you said Janice and Jambres, they'd say, OK, uh, Pharaoh's magicians at the times of the time of the plagues. You know, the magicians who the first plague was blood, wasn't it? Uh, the water turning to blood. And, and they said, that's fine. We can do that. And then the second plague was the frogs, wasn't it? And, 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 and they said, that's fine, we can do that one. And then the th was it the third one was the gnats um, or midges or mosquitoes or whatever you call them. And, and for some reason, they couldn't do that. Gnats defeated them. Uh, 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 and so they were defeated. So you remember that story back in Exodus 7. So there they are, but they opposed Moses. And these people are like them. Verse 8, they, uh, they also oppose the truth. They're corrupted in mind. They're disqualified regarding the faith. So they're not genuine pastors or even genuine believers. They're twisted. But they won't get very far because their folly, their foolishness will be plain. It will be evident to everybody, as was that of these two men when they couldn't do gnats. Um, you know, at that point, it became evident that they, they couldn't do something. So then you say to yourself, well, Paul, why... You really want the apostle here, don't you? Paul, why have you made this analogy? And th this is where you really have to sort of think. And this is, this is where it takes so long preparing. So I think I get the bad stuff. I get that the bad stuff's happening in church with people who look the part. I get that they're influencing people badly, these, these, these weak women in Ephesus. But why this stuff about Pharaoh's magicians opposing Moses? And then I say to myself, and this is one of these sort of moments where you're, you're thinking and thinking, what's the problem with these poor women? They're burdened with sins. They're burdened with a heavy burden of sins. And what these people do to them doesn't release them from that burden because they don't give them a gospel that sets them free or a truth that sets them free. And then you say to yourself, what's going on at the time of Moses and Pharaoh's magicians? And you say to yourself, uh, was anybody burdened? <laughs> and you think, yeah, yeah, the Hebrews were burdened, weren't they? They were in slavery. They were enslaved and burdened. And what was the battle between Moses and Pharaoh's magicians? The battle was between burden and slavery, keep them in slavery, and redemption and freedom from slavery. That's what Moses was doing under God, was, was bringing them out of slavery. So then you think, actually, there's a remarkable appropriateness about this. A remarkable appropriateness. Here, is, here, are, here are people burdened, enslaved under Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's magicians are seek, seeking to keep them enslaved. And Moses brings them out of slavery as the redeemer. And here are these women burdened, enslaved to their sins. And these people are seeking to keep them enslaved to their sins. And the gospel and the word of truth that Timothy is to preach is going to bring them out of their sins. 
At which point you think, ah, oh, I'm beginning to see what's going on. So then you say to yourself, and there you are in the kitchen working away, and you say to yourself, what might the theme of the passage be? Because you've got, you've got times of difficulty, bad stuff happening, two, three, four. It's happening in church, verse five. You, you've got stuff that looks the part. It has the appearance of godliness, but denies its power. Um, and Timothy's to avoid those people um, but, but because they say that they are godly, they say that they are Christians, that they're believers. He wouldn't have to avoid them if they were openly non-Christian. Uh, you know that from uh, 1 Corinthians 5, for example, that, that, that you know, if, they, if they're not saying they're Christian, you don't avoid them. You try to reach them with the gospel, but they say they're Christian. And so Timothy must keep his distance from them because this kind of appearance of godliness um, uh, keeps people enslaved. And you say to yourself, there's something going on here. My theme sentence was something like this, fake Christianity, because that's what's going on here. It's, it's something that looks like Christianity, but it's a fake. Fake Christianity cannot set us free. So I came up with something like that, because that seems to be the, what's holding the thing together. You've got this bad stuff, and it's pretending to be Christian. And the result is that people are kept in their, under the burden of sin and they're not set free, just as the Israelites, the Hebrew slaves, were burdened and not, and not set free. Well, they wouldn't have been set free had it not been for the power of God through um, Moses. So my theme sentence is something like that. And then my aim sentence, if my theme sentence is something like fake Christianity cannot set you free, my theme sentence, and I would take the the cue from verse 5, avoid such people. Keep well clear of fake Christianity or flee fake Christianity. Keep well clear of it. Avoid such, because that's the big thrust of it. Tim Timothy's told, you, you mustn't be like these people. You must keep your distance from these people so that in Ephesus, people will see that the gospel you're preaching is completely different from this fake Christianity. And people may, the danger of a fake, of course, is that people mistake it for the real thing. That's the danger. As women think they're into Christianity, but actually they're being fed something which is a fake because it denies the power of the gospel to change lives. So there would be, that would be my sort of theme and aim. Now, I, I don't think that's too bad, actually. I think that, you know, I'm reasonably happy with that. Just worth saying, um, because we've been having these power cuts, I heard somebody at breakfast talking about it. I, I, I remember once I was preaching in an evening service in the winter in South London in Wimbledon. And um, five minutes into, uh, into the sermon, the, the power went out and we were in complete darkness. And eventually somebody found a candle or a torch or something or other so that I could see my notes. But to start with, every, we were all in complete darkness. And I thought, well, what do I do? And I, I thought to myself, well, I've still got a voice and they've still got ears. And um, so I'm going to carry on. And I did carry on by the grace of God. But the, the reason I could carry on is that I had a clear sense in my own mind and on my heart of the main theme of the passage I was preaching and of the aim um, of the impact that I believed that it should have. And if you've got a clear sense in your mind and heart of the main point and the main thrust of the passage, you can keep on preaching um, even without your notes because uh, I couldn't see anything um, for, 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 for quite a while and you can and it may be not quite so tidy but you can do it and I, I often wondered but I never quite had the nerve to do this I don't know if it happens in Canada but if you're doing a driving test in the UK there's, there's something called an emergency stop do you have that in driving tests in Canada it's an emergency stop which means that, that if you're doing a driving test at some point the examiner you don't know when but at some point the examiner will say stop and, and then you have to stop quickly but safely that that's that's you know to show that you can stop quickly but safely in an emergency and I I, I, I often wonder when our students Jonathan knows this when our students were doing their practice sermons and, and 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 so on I I would love to have had the nerve at some point just to say stop give me your notes now carry on without them and it would have been a good exercise you know because if somebody if somebody had no idea of the main point and the thrust of the passage. You're just stuck, aren't you? Unless you've got a photographic memory. Um, but if you've got those there, you can go on and it may be a bit more ragged, but you can, you can do it. So there's something quite, you know, it was quite interesting that experience when the lights went, went out. Let me talk then about a little bit more about how you, you sort of put the thing together. You've done that work on the 
passage, you've worked through it, you've had a go at coming up with a theme and an aim. How would you set about putting it together? Um, you, you need to start early. I, I, I was thinking last night I probably ought to say those of you, and the, most of you, I guess, are preaching this Sunday. And if you are preaching this Sunday, um, if you haven't already read through the passage and begun to think about it, you need to do that at least this evening at the very latest. Um, perhaps I can say that in a sort of avuncular kind of way. You really do need to do that. Because if you leave it till Thursday before you begin your preparation, unless you are spiritually much more receptive than I am, you, you won't get there. You won't have time to mull on it and pray on it. And so I, I think you start as early as you can, and probably you've already started and you've read it. And you may not have had sustained preparation time working through it in detail, but you've read it and you've begun to think about it. And, you know, in Cambridge we cycle around everywhere. As I cycle around, I'll be thinking about something that's coming up to preach. I'm preaching on Sunday week back in our home church, and I'm beginning to think about it already um, because I'm slow. It takes me a long time for God to work, to open my eyes, to, to think. So you, you, you start early, and you, 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 you pray, and you do the attentive work on, the, on the, um, the, 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 the text. And then you spend time shaping and pruning the talk. And I spend quite a lot of time trying to shape and, 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 and prune the talk. I tend to use paper and pen. I mean, because of my generation, I just think more freely with paper and pen. And I want to be able to scribble and draw lines here and there. And I come up with lots of different ideas and I cross them out. And then I come up with something else and I cross them out. And, you know, it, it's like, I suppose in the old days, it would be a palimpsest, wouldn't it? You know, it's all written on top of each other. You've got all these things written again and again and again different things that you're you're playing around with but you're trying to shape it and I'm trying to think how does it how does it work in terms of the shape of the passage how does the theme and aim how am I going to come up with teaching points that will really nail the the truth of the passage I was really struck actually although Jonathan apologized that we didn't have them on the screen but Jonathan if I got these right I think last night you had God has spoken his supreme word in Jesus was that right, verses 1 to 4? God has given the supreme name to Jesus, which was most of the rest of chapter 1, really. And therefore, third point, we must listen to Jesus, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Now, I, I'm guessing Jonathan didn't just sort of glance at the passage and think, those are my points. I'm guessing you had various false starts. Yeah, I mean, that's it, isn't it? And, and coming up with something that, you know, that's good, isn't it? Because the first two are sort of have a certain symmetry, and they kind of nail the truth. God has spoken his supreme word in Jesus. There's something definite and clear. God has given the supreme name to Jesus, definite and clear, and it kind of encapsulates, nails the main point um, of, of that section of it. And then the one, we must listen to Jesus, that that's the implication. That's what we must do. But that's really, I think getting that well is really hard. I mean, you'll know times when you've, you've got things that, just help to nail the thing well and you, you just think oh thank you Lord that, that that's okay and other times you think oh it's just sort of fluffy and I haven't quite got it it's really hard to do that so my take with this passage would be something like let me see what I did this was I haven't preached this for a long time but I had something like I from verses one to five beware fake Christianity that was my that was my first point or heading one to five beware fake christianity so that's two three four five here is fake christianity and the end of verse five avoid such people so beware fake christianity that was my first point and that worked pretty well it's crisp you know people can get hold of that it's not it's not long and wordy and complicated beware fake christianity and if you can get a point that's applicatory, like Jonathan's third point last night was applicatory, we must listen to Jesus. Um, and in this case, that's, that's beware fake Christianity. It's not, you, you can have a sort of academic -y ones, like in the first century church in Ephesus, there was deceptive church stuff going on that looked Christian, but wasn't really Christian. And Paul tells Timothy to avoid it. That's true, but it doesn't kind of nail it very well, does it? Whereas beware fake Christianity. Beware fake Christianity is saying that's what it meant for Timothy, beware fake Christianity, but actually that's what it means both for pastors and people today. 
you know, I think you could just draw the line there for pastors and people beware of fake Christianity. And then I think I just had one more point. I might have had two more p points, but I think now I would just have one more point from verse 6 through to verse 9. Because fake Christianity enslaves. So it's a sort of dot, dot, dot continuing from the first one. Beware fake Christianity because fake Christianity enslaves or it can't set you free. And there you've got your motivation. It's a, it's a dreadful thing because it leaves you burdened by sins with no forgiveness or, or freedom. Now, whenever you come up with teaching points, you're always simplifying. You always have to make judgments as to how many to have. You're not writing a commentary. If you're writing a commentary, you've got to th go through every word, every phrase, you know, everything in detail. That's what, that's what you hope a commentary will do. But when you're preaching, you're not writing a commentary. So you want something that will, will be crisp and clear. I, I think I have in mind very often when I'm preaching that I want I want people who aren't particularly academic to be able to follow and get it. It's, it's, it's a terribly sad thing if somebody comes to church and thinks, if I'm not clever, I can't be a Christian. It's a bit of a disease. I mean, I'm in, you know, in Cambridge, which is a sort of wordy, clever place. A lot of clever people in Cambridge. But there are some perfectly ordinary people as well. And if the ordinary people think, I can't be a Christian unless I'm clever, it's really bad. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious I want to preach in a way that, that the the least academic person listening can get and understand. So then I'll, 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 I'll begin to sort of flesh out the points and think, how am I going to show that, that it comes from the passage? How am I going to take people, put rub their noses in the passage, take them through it? Uh, do I want illustrations? I thought, I was very struck actually by one or two of Jonathan's illustrations last night. The, I, I really liked, Jonathan, I really liked the, 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 the way you used the word secretary as an illustration of a word which can have different meanings depending on the context, which was your illustrating that sun can have different meanings in the scripture. It's really helpful that. Because it wasn't difficult. Everybody knows that a secretary can be quite a junior position or use secretary of state, which you, you know, as a senior position. And I'm thinking, okay, I get that. I get that sun could mean something uh, of fairly modest importance, or it could mean something of supreme importance. And, and so it was a helpful illustration. Beware illustrations that are hugely emotional, because then that's all people will remember. Um, or illustrations that are so complicated that people can't... I mean, we can all remember illustrations, can't we, from sermons we've heard, and we can't remember what they illustrate. I can remember some wonderful illustrations, and, uh, but, but they, 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 I can't remember what they illustrated, so probably they didn't function very well. They were great stories or whatever, but they didn't function very well. But I'm going to think a little bit about illustration. I'm going to try to get illustration from within the passage, if I can. I mean, verse 6 and 7, it's not exactly an illustration, but it's almost a YouTube clip, isn't it? You can see these men creeping in. And even if we don't know exactly what happened, you, you get a sense, you sort of, a little bit of retelling of the story. You don't need to bring illustrative material in from outside. And of course, Pharaoh's magicians in verse 8 is a Bible illustration. There it is. And I'm quite old-fashioned. I quite like to have an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading. And so I would probably have part of Exodus 7 as the Old Testament reading. And then, you know, you're helped as a preacher. You can, you've got that illustration there. Probably the last thing I do when I'm putting a sermon together is to think about the beginning and the end. I'll tell you what I do, and there aren't rules for this, but I'll tell you what I do, and you may or may not find this helpful. For the beginning, I, I, I tend to try to start with a kind of applicatory hook. To, to and, and the aim of the hook is partly to grab people's attention, but not just that, because you can grab people's attention in lots of ways. But I want to grab people's attention in such a way that it, to use a golfing analogy, it kind of tees up the application, and the aim and the thrust and the response that I'm going to be going for at the end. So for this passage, I might have something like, um, you know, what do you think is one of the greatest obstacles to Christianity in our country today? Or something like that. You begin to open up that the greatest obstacle is not the liberal media or the aggressive atheists or Muslims or whoever it may be, that perhaps the greatest danger is when you get fake Christianity within churches or pastors. And, and it, it's not difficult to find examples of, of that sort of, of thing. 
Um, so you're starting with that. So you're just getting people thinking about fake Christianity at the beginning. And it's kind of teeing you up for hitting the drive at the end, which is to, to beware that, keep well clear of that um, at, at the end. I would, I would tend to do that at the very beginning. Um, I was reading an article some years ago. Somebody was saying that often a story will create a disequilibrium at the beginning and then restore it at the end. There's a problem to be solved or a mystery to be unraveled or an outrage to be avenged or a quest to be fulfilled. There's some reason for reading on or listening on in a story. And a good sermon, this writer was saying, is, is often like that. There's a, there's, a, there's a problem, fake Christianity, and it's, 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 it's terribly dangerous and so on. And I need to know that that's going to be resolved in some way by the end. So I think about the beginning, but I can't think about the beginning until I have worked at the passage and I've got my theme and aim and I've got a sense of where I'm going with it. And then I'll write the beginning. I might draft a beginning, but I probably have to scrap it several times before I get something I'm happy with. I tend, just as a personal preference, to set the passage in context after that hook. So I tend to start with that question, what's, you know, what's the most da biggest danger to Christianity in Canada today or whatever it is and you just open that up briefly and then say the passage we're going to consider comes in the middle of a letter of Paul to early author authoritative leaders apostle to a young younger pastor church leader um, and he's just been talking about this summing up the previous passage if you were here last week you'll remember that or whatever it is and then I set it in context. I tend not to do the context up front at the very beginning. And that's just personally because I find context often not very motivating. I, you know, if somebody says, last week we had this, but now we're having this, I sort of switch off. But I'm, I mean, I'm perverse. But maybe there are one or two people I'm speaking to who are perverse. So I'll tend to go for, you know, here's, here's an issue I need to think about. And then to say, now here's the passage and, and this is what it's in and this is where it comes and so on at that point and then launch in and go through the passage and then at the end I want to try to make sure that my conclusion um, my conclusion packs the main punch of the passage so last night we had that perfectly and of course it was easier in a way last night because the last bit of the passage chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 packed the punch so it's very natural to do that but I think in, in, in if I was preaching this passage avoid such people. That would be my punch that I want to, to, to come to at the end. In other words, I, want my, I, I don't want at the end to introduce some completely novel idea uh, that, that hasn't been there. I want to take what's been built up over the passage, the building up of the, the main theme and the main thrust of the passage, and then I want to press that home at the end. Um, and I, I find increasingly that I'll give myself time at the end of a sermon when I may not have anything much in my notes and I won't introduce any new cognitive content, no new cognitive content at all. So if somebody is taking notes, they can probably stop taking notes for the last few minutes because I simply want to press home and I want to give, give us time for our minds and our hearts and our emotions and our wills to catch up with what we've got. Because some preaching I've done in the past has been a little bit like a lecture. And people will sit there writing notes and then they'll finish writing notes and then I'll stop. And they'll have got some good notes and maybe the content was quite good, but they won't really have felt or responded to that. So increasingly, I'll, I'll give a few minutes towards the end just to pressing it home. I think, Jonathan, you did that last night, didn't you? The last few minutes you were pressing it home by way of application. And I think I didn't need to write anything much down at the end, but I was listening and thinking, yep, I need to, this is, this is how I should be responding to this. And that's, that's a really good thing. And now it's a discipline, isn't it? Because we all struggle, you know, whatever time window you work with in your church, whatever the sort of culture is, and whatever time window you have for preaching, we always have too much material, don't we? You know, the, the preparation always leaves us full of all sorts of good things. And we always have too much. The danger is trying, well, I could just squeeze a bit more in. And sometimes to, to prune more ruthlessly and just have a bit more time to press the main thing home may make for a better sermon. It's really hard 
because we love the, all the things we've found. David Jackman, my predecessor at Cornhill, used to talk about killing your babies, which is a sort of rather, he's a gentleman. It's a rather, it's a rather strangely violent image from, from a very gentle man. But you know, the, the idea is that as you've, as you've been working at your sermon, you've, you've given birth to lots of babies. There are lots of lovely baby ideas around, and they're beautiful babies, and you're really rather fond of them all. And uh, you just have to take a knife and k- kill about half of them. <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't, no, no. I think the, the, the south of the United States, it would probably work better, wouldn't it? They're, they're okay. But, the idea that you, you have to prune so you've got something coherent. So you think if you were writing a commentary and you just said this passage means fake Christianity isn't a very good idea and we ought to run away from it and the reason is that it doesn't liberate you from sin, um, you'd be a bit disappointed in the commentary because you'd think actually that I want the commentary to tell me all the other things that I'm needing to, to, to find out. But a good sermon may be like that. We used to have at, at Cornhill a little, um, a little thing called the crèche test, which I invented. And the crèche test works like this. A young mother has left her baby in the crèche for the first time. And she leaves the, her little sprog in the crèche. And as she leaves the little sprog, she's not really paying attention to the sermon. She comes back into the main um, meeting. But all the time she's thinking, is little Sprog screaming and, and, and so on? And does little Sprog need me? So she's not paying much attention to the sermon, but she's there. Then she goes back at the end to the creche, and the person running the creche says to her, um, how was the sermon? And, and she says, it was fine. So the, 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 what was the sermon about? And if this young mother, who's only listened to a proportion of the sermon, uh, says, I don't really know, he said lots of good things, and I'm sure they were wonderful, but I don't really know what he said, um, you fail the crèche test. If she says, actually, I wasn't listening to very much, but I'm pretty sure the main point was this, (laughs) um, it's a win. It's quite a good test, that, isn't it? You say, you know, somebody who's only paying partial attention, which is true of everybody, not just the young mum. I mean, realistically, everybody's only paying partial attention. Um, But if the person paying very partial attention gets the main thrust and goes away thinking, I need to beware fake Christianity because it it, it enslaves, it's never going to set me free. If they get that, then you've somehow the main point of the sermons got across. I need to stop. Jonathan, I've gone on slightly. We started just a tiny bit late and I took liberties, uh, went on a bit. A few minutes of Q&A and then break for coffee. A few minutes of Q&A, co- comments, thoughts. Um, I've talked rather randomly. I often do talk randomly. Very happy to have comments. Or Thank you, Ben. That's r- really helpful. And of course, the end of chapter two, a, Timothy is to be kind and maybe God will give them repentance. There's that hopefulness there. And so I think when I preached it, I hope I did address that slight tension that you want to win the people but the reason Timothy has to keep his distance is that they're in church and they're actively infiltrating church families and and therefore they are doing great damage and therefore we must keep you know Timothy must keep his distance yes yes I think so I think so and it's that that picture of what they're doing that means it's really vital Timothy distinguishes himself from them yeah Um, my experience is that I have to settle on something not too late so I have Saturday normally as a day off so I want to make sure it's put to bed on Friday night and unless by Thursday I've got I've settled on something even if I'm not sure if I don't do that then I don't have enough time to pray myself into the shoes of the people I'm going to preach to and to, 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 to think and pray and then to preach in such a way that it engages with him or her and that, that, that a partial, you know, inchoate, not completely settled everything where I'm not totally happy with it but where I've got time to think about that makes for a better sermon than one where I've gone on and on trying to get that and then I don't have time to think how to press it home. That's my experience. I think it's a danger because there's always the thought that maybe if I just pick one more book off the bookshelf, that'll just unlock it. Um, but it's, it's a sort of mirage sometimes. Yeah, I, I can. I mean, the Puritans did it a lot. So William Perkins, who was a, um, an early Puritan, after whom our dog was named, 
Um, he used to work with, he had seven categories of people. So he had unbelievers who were ignorant and unteachable. He said those who are ignorant but teachable, those who are knowledgeable but not humble, those who are humble but need encouragement, those who believe and need a grounding in the faith, those who've fallen into sin and wonder if they can be restored. And then category seven was the mingled, in other words, the confused. I, I struggle with that. I remember we had a student at Cornhill once from another country who would always have sort of seven points of application at every place. And it just got so confusing. So I, I'm a bit more rough and ready about it. Others may be more systematic. I mean, it's a cultural thing and a style thing, partly. Do others have wisdom on that? You know, the, the, the thinking of particular kinds of people? I guess I'm always, I'm always asking myself, what are the particular ways in which this danger impacts the people I'm speaking to? And that's something that as a pastor, you know, and maybe nobody else will know. I also think about my own heart. And my danger with fake Christianity is not those kinds of books. My danger is, um, I know a lot and I can go through the motions pretty well and I can look the part pretty convincingly while inwardly it's not right. That's my danger. And it, one of the big things I didn't say, of course, is that because 2 Timothy is addressed to a pastor, um, in one sense you want two purpose statements. You want a purpose statement for the pastor, you know, what Timothy is to do and what the pastor is to do and another purpose statement for the people. You know, this is what you want your pastor to do. Uh, that can become a bit formulaic when you're doing the pastoral letters, but it's always sort of there in the background because it's addressed to a pastor, and I didn't pay much attention to that. I'd use the same process, but the structuring of the sermon might be different. I mean, I'm guessing there might at some point be a conference like this where narrative was the focus and there'd be some particulars for narrative as to how that works. But I would still do the analysis. I'd be working at the text. What does it say? So what? How should we respond? How am I going to put this together and get it across? But, but the way in which I structure it wouldn't necessarily be the same. Mm -hmm.